the power of salvation. Welcome to Impact Thursday Night. Um, I'm continuing on to part two of a lesson I'm doing on For the Love of God. It's a gospel teaching series. And I can pretty much assure you that the gospel, if you weren't here last week, that the gospel that I'm teaching is probably not the same way that it's been taught before. Because this did not come out of uh, books or commentaries or mm, sermons it came out of a frustration of an engineer that wanted to really understand how things work. So I just got with God after wearing out a few pastors and other people. And he gave me a, what I'll consider to be a revelational gospel teaching. And that's what we're talking about. For those who were not here last week, uh, we were talking about the purpose of creation. Now, this class is called The Original Sin. And it follows after the first class. The first class being the purpose of creation. And, and if you weren't here, the, the, what we went through the Bible, particularly back in, all the way to Genesis, to understand why is it that God created us. Because as an engineer, until you know your purpose, it's really, really difficult to figure out what's wrong. And so the whole purpose is why were we created. Key scripture was, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And what we discovered was that the God of the universe wanted someone to spend his eternal life with. He wanted a family. And he created us to fill that void. He wanted someone in his own image. And that's us. And we were created for that fellowship and for that relationship and for that marriage. And we have a short period of time here maybe 7,000 years total, to start that, that time together. He, this is the selection time when he chooses his bride. And we're in that time now. But it's the beginning of something wonderful. Because a man doesn't get married at the end of his life. He gets married at the beginning of his life. And why do you think that is? Someone to share his life with. And God wants someone to share his eternal life with. He is going to, he's a creator and he's going to continue to create. And we shared about that. But I think he wants someone to share it with. So the purpose of creation, for Adam no suitable helper was found, but for God no suitable helper was found. And we were the ones created. So he created us for that purpose. We also looked to see that why did God create man and woman? He didn't have to do that. The whole concept of, of male, female, and procreation, what's that all about? Well, what we discovered is that God did that so we could understand the relationship he wants to have with us. He didn't have to create male and female, man and woman, but he did it so that we could understand the relationship, him being the male, us being the female. And it was also we can understand. We're down here learning right now. We're in roles of both male and female. But, of course, as we learned, when we get to heaven, it's not going to be that way. We're not going to be married to each other in heaven. We're going to be married to him. Why did God create marriage? We talked about the fact that God created marriage so that he could take us, maybe even a a creation created long after many other creations and take us and promote us all the way from wherever we were to be by his side. Just like the king who marries a common woman. When a king marries a common woman, what does she become? The queen. Does she have to go to queen school and get all of this? Or does she, when the minute he marries her, that's who she is. She's moved all the way from wherever she was. You know, say, Ask Kate Middleton. Her identity changed pretty quick. Well, that's what's happening to us. God created marriage that he could have someone to be one with. And right now, he's selecting that bride. That's what this is all about. So we are going to get promoted above all other creations to be by his side. And he's using the concept of marriage to do it. That's why we talked about last week, you, we best not mess with that. Because God created it for a purpose we don't understand. We go changing the rules, start you know, hyphenating our names or the things that we might do. 
uh, which not, maybe is a good reason for it here, but you don't want to do that with God. He's got rules and they make sense when you understand them relative to our relationship with him. So that's what we talked about last week. We ended with the scripture out of Revelation. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. So who is it that sits on the throne with the king? That's right. The bride or the queen. So what we're saying is here, to him who overcomes, I'm going to give the right to sit with me on my throne. That's what's happening right now. We're in the process of that. But what is the question that we should be asking here? To him who does what? Overcome. So what is the question you should be asking? Overcome, Overcome what? what? <laughs> exactly. And that uh, enters this lesson. So let's talk about this lesson. Overcome what? This lesson is the original sin. In the pride of your heart... You say, I am a God. Ezekiel 28, 2b is our scripture. And we're going to ask, answer some of those questions tonight. We're going to say, what concerns would the Lord have about taking a bride who he will be married to for eternity? You think, you think he ought to be concerned? Have you looked around lately? I mean, we're, what are we married? 10 years, up, maybe up to 50 years. If you do really well, life's good. So you've got concerns about someone you're going to be married to for 50 years? Well, maybe God has some concerns. Well, where, where would this have come from? Well, how's the Lord going to decide who he's going to marry? That's one big concern. How do we know? When you're young, where do you get the information? Maybe you get it from your parents, right? But where did your parents get the information about who would marry? Maybe they got it from experience. So maybe there's some experience here that we need to understand. Because maybe it matters who you marry. Maybe some of us figured that out <laughs> along the way. So it does matter. So God wants to marry someone, but who's it going to be? Is it going to be everybody? You think everybody? that he created is going to be the bride? No. no, we're in a qualification round here. And the question is, who is going to be the bride? Maybe you think, well, I'm saved. I'm going to be the bride. I've got my lamp. Right? But there were 10 of them that had lamps. And only five of them made it in. In Matthew 25. <coughs> so, he who overcomes... So how's the Lord going to decide who he's going to marry? Well, we talked about that, that maybe there's some experience here. So maybe God actually has experience with relationships, and maybe we can go back and look. Now, we are not going to know what his relationships were like all the way back to eternity past. But there's one neat thing that he did. He gave us the Bible. So what we have is what he chose to include about himself. And I think that's where we should be looking. Because the things that are important, that's what he included for us. So let's go back and look in the Bible about the possible relationships that the Lord had and what he might be concerned about. Hence the original sin. So let's look at the original sin. So, so what was the original sin? Who is the original sinner? And where did it take place? This is sort of like the game of Clue, right? <laughs> Colonel Mustard in the library with the candlestick, right? So, what was the original sin? Pride. Pride? You know, you're in disagreement with what a lot of the dictionaries say. They say it's disobedience. Well, no. <laughs> you're, you're correct. Well, so, who was the original sinner? You read the books, and it says Adam was. Where did it take place? In the Garden of Eden. Well, let's look at that. Original sin. In Christian theology, the condition of sin 
that marks all humans as a result of Adam's first act of disobedience. So they believe that the original sin was Adam's disobedience. And the Catholic Encyclopedia basically says the same thing, the sin committed by Adam, and, or the consequence, the hereditary stain that we have. That's the original sin. But let's look and see what the word says. Let's go back even further. How about let's go back to Isaiah 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. So who are we talking about here? Satan or Lucifer, right? Because it says, O morning star, right? And of course, his, his name means morning star or he who brings light or light bearer. So apparently, we're going to talk about Satan or Lucifer, but apparently he was something before he was called this the devil with horns called Satan, right? He was a light bearer. But it said, you said where? In your heart. Have we heard anything about the heart? Didn't you just prophesy about the heart? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the top of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. A lot of I wills there, isn't there? So if the devil's the great I will, what's God? The I am. Ah, exactly. He doesn't have to say I will. He's I am. So we, we look at this and we say, what disobedience was here? Do you think God gave him a law and said, you will not ascend to heaven. You will not raise your throne above my throne. Is that what he said? Do you think it was disobedience was the main issue here? No. Well, let's, let's take a look and see. Let's start with a little understanding of Ezekiel 28. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the sovereign Lord says. So let's talk about the ruler of Tyre first. And by the way, here's a, a sort of a picture of Tyre and Sidon. They're right together. And it ruled the whole Phoenician Empire, which was like a world government at the time. Very close to it. So this is the ruler of Tyre. And let's see what we see about him. In the pride of your heart, you say... I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God. Now, where could he have gotten that? Let's back up a little bit. I'll make myself like the Most High. I will raise my throne. You see that? Does that sound familiar to you? He says, uh, sit on a throne in the heart of the seas, but you are a man, God is saying, and not a God, though you think you're as wise as a God. So this is some man who is being influenced by someone who do you think he's being influenced by? Right? We just read about it. That's a big influence of Lucifer, but this is a man. But let's look and figure out who this man was. This man was actually Ethbaal II. He's the ruler of Tyre and Sidon during the time of Ezekiel. His predecessor and namesake in the dynasty was Ethbaal I, 2,800 years earlier. And most of this whole dynasty named themselves something Baal, or Baal something. But the first one was Ethbaal, and now this is Ethbaal II. Ethbaal I was actually a priest of Baal. And then through uh, conniving and a lot of uh, evil things that he did and murder and so on, he was able to get to the throne. He was the priest of Baal, but he was able to take over the throne. His name means with Baal or possessed by Baal. So what does Baal mean? Well, Baal means either master, owner, lord, husband, or God. Now, who do you think Baal is? Can you see it? What did, what did Lucifer or Satan say? I will make myself like, like God. So can you see that Baal is the devil? He's Lucifer, basically, wanting to be God. And, he's, uh, and this man, Ethbaal, is his man. It's sort of like the anti-God, if you will. Can you see the picture? Can you see almost the prophetic picture of the situation? 
So this is Ethbaal 2, and we're going to look a, a little bit at Ethbaal 1, because Ethbaal 1 is also mentioned in the Bible. In 1 Kings 16, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the sight of the Lord than any of those before him. He did not consider it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, you know, golden calves, that sort of thing. But he also married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, one king of the Sidonians, the, the Tower of Sidon. So who was Jezebel? Basically, the daughter of the devil, wouldn't you say that? Can you see this? Well, let's look on. So when Ahab married her, he began to serve Baal and set up altars, and he built a temple in Samaria to Baal. So let's talk about this. What's going on here? It says that he made these Asherah poles, and he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than any of the kings before him. And you know what? Some of the kings before him weren't all that hot. God was pretty ticked off at them. So this guy did something that really upset him. So let's look at what happened. First of all, who was Ahab? The king of Israel. So the king of Israel married, literally, the daughter of the devil, if you will. So he joined himself to the situation. Can you see a problem here? It, now, does this sound like disobedience to you? Or is there something a little bit bigger going on here? You see the problem. So let, let's say that you're, you get married, a man gets married, and he says, okay, we're going to get married, but I'm going to give you two rules. The first rule is, <clears throat> you, uh, don't go out and buy shoes without talking to me first. Rule number one. Rule number two, don't commit adultery with my best friend. Okay? So maybe, what if she went out and she slipped up and got the shoes before talking to him? What would you call that? Maybe you could call it disobedience, right? But on the other hand, if, if she goes out and sleeps with his best friend, is disobedience really the issue here? Is that what you're going to focus on? I told you not to do that. Or is there something bigger here? So can you see what it was that really moved God to anger? It's not just the disobedience. This is adultery. This is the king of Israel joining himself to the false god and choosing the false god over him. So can you see that there's something much deeper here than what we call disobedience? And can you see what... God is really concerned about. Remember, God's looking for someone to have to hold, to love and to cherish, to spend his eternal life with, right? For eternity. So it's all about the... We talked about that last week. What's it about? It's about... Does anybody remember? It's about... It's about the relationship, stupid. Remember? <laughs> That's for us guys. <laughs> it's the relationship, stupid. That's what he's basically saying. It's not about disobedience here. There's something much deeper that he's looking for. So let's go back to Ezekiel 28. We just said that we're probably talking about Baal. So now we're going to talk about Son of Man take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre. So if the other guy was the ruler of Tyre, who do you think is the king of Tyre? If Baal is the ruler, then who's the king? Baal, <laughs> exactly. So that's what we have here. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You are the model of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You are in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone adorned you. And listed all these beautiful stones. So who is this? Lucifer. But look at the description here. Guys, if you were looking at this description, who is this? I mean, look at the description without even thinking about who this is, and what do you see? You see a beautiful woman. Someone you love, don't you? Isn't that how 
we guys, see, you ladies. I mean, isn't that what this is? Can you see a relationship here? That there was a relationship between God and Lucifer. They hung out in the Garden of Eden together. And Lucifer was the model of perfection, wisdom, and beauty. Sounds pretty much like they had a relationship. And that Lucifer was created for a special relationship. You go on and it says, Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created, but those words are actually translated timbrel and pipes. It's interesting, but that maybe Lucifer was there to, with music, was there to worship and cover the throne with worship. So Lucifer didn't start this way. Lucifer started, sounds like, in a relationship with the Lord God there in the Garden of Eden, a great place to spend their time together. But let's see how that worked out. You guys probably know. <laughs> You were anointed as a guardian cherub, so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. So where is this, by the way? Do you think this is the Garden of Eden on earth or the Garden of Eden in heaven? You were in Eden, the Garden of God. Do you, I don't remember seeing a bunch of fiery stones in the Garden of Eden down here. I think this was in heaven. A garden in heaven. There was a Garden of Eden up there. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till what? Wickedness was found in you through your widespread trade. If you look that up, that's actually immoral transactions. <laughs> He's fooling around. Let's, let's, I mean, that's what I see. Widespread trade. You were filled with violence and you did what? So where's the original sin? Sounds to me like it's right here. Is it disobedience? Thou shalt not be wicked? Do you see that there's something here greater than disobedience? There's a full betrayal. There's a full heartbreak. There's a full relationship in this thing. It's not just disobedience. Let me go on. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. There's another clue that it was in heaven. So what emotion do you think you see here out of God? Anger. anger. Yeah, anger, disappointment. Can you see where you might get this? You messed up. You know, you bought shoes when you shouldn't have. That's not what this is about. <laughs> this is a, a deep, heartfelt betrayal. He's angry. So what happened? Your heart became proud. Did you see a term that keeps coming up? You see, these things are about the heart. You said in your heart. That, isn't, that really isn't disobedience. It didn't say you even did it. It says, you said in your heart, I will do these things. This is about an issue of what? The heart. Disobedience isn't necessarily about the heart. This is an issue of the heart. Your heart became proud. On account of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor, so I threw you to earth and made a spectacle of you before the royalty. So, why didn't God, you think, just take us all to heaven? Why didn't he just give us everything? Let's, why didn't he just make us all beautiful and perfect and just take us right to heaven for his bride? He did that. He tried that, didn't he? But now, imagine that the God of the universe is saying, but I still, I want someone to spend my eternal life with. Someone to have and to hold, to love and to cherish for eternity. So I'm not going to give up. I'm going to try again. So maybe he creates the earth, and maybe he creates another Garden of Eden. Only this time, he puts Adam and Eve down there. He's going to try again. But now, how do you make sure that Adam and Eve don't do the same thing that he did? See the problem here? When the Son of Man comes, 
Will he find obedience on the earth? Oh, faith? Will he find faith? If you're going to marry someone for eternity, what is the one thing that you want to make sure? Will she be faithful? Sound familiar? Will the Son of Man find faith? Will she be faithful? Can you see this? I think this is what it's about. I don't think it's about obedience, even though I know the Pharisees seem to think so. Let's look at something else about our friend Lucifer here. This is about the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Now the whole world had one language and one common speech. This is when mankind was coming together to form the first world government. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. So, sound like um, pride maybe? Your heart was full of pride? So mankind's going to do all of this, but where do you think they got the idea? Does this sound familiar to you? I will do what? I'll raise my throne above the heavens. Do you see what he was, they were doing? They're building a throne for the devil. They're raising this throne above the clouds. And, you know, after all, now you've got to understand, this is Nimrod that's doing this. Nimrod was a, a, alive for about 300 years while Noah was still alive. He's Noah's grand, great-grandson, I believe. So you would think, God saved us from this. Let's build an altar to the Lord. He saved us from all this flood. and did. But no, they're doing something else here. Does it sound familiar, though? Who is influencing this? Now, I believe mankind was doing this because they were deceived. If they would have finished building the tower, what do you think would have happened? The devil would have come in and sat right down on top of it and claim to be God. But they didn't understand that at the time. They think, oh, we're building a tower because, you know, we're, this is going to make ourselves a great nation. But they didn't know any better. They were deceived. They were building a tower for the devil. But God saw it, and he decided to stop it. How did he do it? Confused their languages. So they scattered, right? And they didn't build a tower. See, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. So, if we look at Genesis 11, here's the plan of man to do this. Well, God frustrated their plan, but he had another plan. I don't know whether it's influenced by man's plan, but all of a sudden now here, just a few verses later, the Lord had said to Abram, I'll make you a great nation, and I will make your name great. Remember, we're going to be a great city, and we're, is the best they could do, and we're going to make our name great. Well, God says, nope, I'm going to pick somebody else, and I'm going to make his name great, and I'm going to make him a great nation. So it's sort of like the Saul and David thing, or the Ishmael and the Isaac thing. Can you see what's happened here? Mankind has their great plan, but God says, no, when it comes to ruling the earth, I've got another plan. Yes, you're going to build your Babylon, and you've got your world government, but I'm going to have my own world government, and it's going to come out of the seed of Abraham. I'm going to take him to a new land, and I'm going to find a new place. Instead of your Babylon... I'm going to find my Jerusalem. We talked about last week, one principle one, which says God makes known the end from the beginning. We showed that right over here is the beginning, Adam and Eve, and right over here is Jesus marrying his bride. It begins with a wedding and it ends with a wedding. He declares the end from the beginning. Well, how about... With Babylon. 
Here's a picture they drew back in the 1500s of the Tower of Babel, unfinished Tower of Babel. Our buddies, the EU, actually decided to use that for their symbol. And this is one of their posters. It says, Europe, many tongues, one voice. You talk, see what I'm saying? They're, they're, so they're going to get this back together because what's happened? God confused their languages and scattered them across the whole earth. But what's happening right now? That's right. With the internet and everything else, is that a problem anymore? No, globalization's the answer. So what are we going to do when we get the global government? We're going to build Babylon again, right? <coughs> Which is the throne of who? But see, we're not going to know it. We're just going to build it, this one world government. But what's going to happen when it gets built? He's going to sit on it. That's right. He's going to come down and sit on it and claim to be God. Only this time, I don't think God's going to stop him from what I can read. But you can see the same plan as it was in the beginning, so it is in the end. It's not like he didn't tell us. So here's their picture. And so here's, they literally are using this picture of the unfinished Tower of Babel. And they got the, the, uh, the, the, the 12 stars out of Revelation 11, I believe, as part of their symbol. That's where they got it. And uh, there's one other thing to notice. See that right there? What do you think that is? That's a crane. <laughs> what do you think that means? That means they're back on building the tower. <laughs> it couldn't get any clearer. You can't make this stuff up, folks. They, they're doing this. And if that's not enough, the, the parliament building for the EU in Strasbourg was literally built after the exact model of the unfinished tower, and they, they claim it that that's what it is. I mean, it just doesn't get any simpler than this. Can you see what's going on? So it's happening now. This is all in our lifetime. We're watching the end from the beginning. So this is Babylon. Now, you see what happened and what this is all about, right? Now, can you see why God might be upset if you take the mark of the one world government? Is it beginning to get clearer what this is about? Is it just about disobedience? So why would God be upset if you're taking the mark of the one world government? Because you're committing adultery. <laughs> I think that says it in Revelation. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen is Babylon the great, for all nations have drunk the maddening wine of her what? Her, her disobedience? Her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed disobedience? No, adultery with her. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sin. So can you see what's going on here? God has a plan. He's got a plan to decide who he's going to marry. If a man had saw, there's a hundred women out there now, which one are you going to marry? So what do you do? Well, you take all hundred, and you take them, and you give them everything that you've got. You make them all rich. You know, you, you, you just make them, give them all the, the, the beauty secrets and everything, right? Is that what you do? If you're going to decide? Now, how are you going to decide which one it's going to be? Yeah, maybe God said, maybe that's not the best way to find out because I tried that and it didn't work. Because I gave Lucifer everything right up front and all it did was all of a sudden now he lifted his throne above my throne. So... Maybe there's another choice here. Maybe you want that hundred to go through something so that you can determine which one it is that you're going to spend your eternal life with. Could that be what's going on down here? Could that be the end game? I just love the way God does things. Isaiah 14, it says, I will ascend to heaven. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. And then in Genesis 11, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. That was the devil's goal. So let's see what God's answer is. In Jeremiah 51, her judgment has reached to the heavens and towers up to the very skies. Revelation 
for her sins are piled up to heaven. Don't you just love the way God does that? You did it, Lucifer. You wanted to make, you know, you wanted to raise your, you did it. Your sins are piled up unto the heavens. So God just has a way with these things, answering. But see, there's a purpose here. And that's what we're going to be looking at. So if it was disobedience, like seems to be the way that it's described, then the Pharisees should have it made, right? Because weren't the Pharisees more obedient than any group of people? far as the law goes. Now, I'm not talking, they really were. These were good guys. They were out doing all sorts of wonderful things out there. And they were being obedient to the law. But then there's the sinners out there, and they're not being very obedient. So if God actually showed up on the earth, then what's he going to do? Well, he's going to go over and congratulate the ones who were obedient, but he's going to be upset at the ones who were disobedient, right? Is that what happened? Let's read. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You got a clue here? Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithe of all that I possess. He's doing these things. He's being obedient. And then, and the tax collector standing far off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now this isn't some poor misunderstood guy. The guy's admitting, I'm a sinner. I'm not obeying the law. I'm a sinner. This guy's obeying the law. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, right standing before God, justified, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. So can you see where the Pharisees might be a little confused here, if they thought the issue was about obedience to the law? Because they should have been congratulated. But that's not what happened. So is this some big mystery? What if... God made it very clear from the beginning what the issue is. You said in your where? Heart. This isn't an issue of the law. It's an issue of the heart. If you're trying to find someone to love you, what do you think you're going to do? Do you think, guys, let me guess. To find your wife, you went out, and you got a bunch of resumes, right? You said, send me your CV, and we're going to go through these things, and we're going to see who's accomplished some great things. Just the same way you had obviously hire a person for a job, right? Is that what's important to you? Is that the way you find your mate? There's a, you see the problem here. That's, what, that's the way we're treating God. We don't understand. This is an issue of the heart. James said it the best. But he gives us more grace, which is what we need. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Do you see the problem here? We think it's always been about right and wrong, obedience and disobedience. We think that's what God's about. But that's not what the Bible says. The churches are out there telling you right now that's what it's about. It's about good and bad, right and wrong. What if I told you it's not? What if I told you that the things that screwed up your relationship are not the things that you did wrong. What if that wasn't what destroyed your relationship, that you made a mistake? Maybe it was because you had a mess up of the heart. Maybe you're prideful, maybe you're arrogant. Maybe it's not that you did something wrong. Can you see this? So why don't we understand how God sees us. Why are we being told that it's all about right and wrong and good and bad? If you're good, you go to heaven. And if you're bad, you go to hell. I got news for you. That is totally wrong. And Jesus proved that when he came. Do you understand? There's going to be a lot of good people in hell. 
if a man's going to get married, there's a lot of good women out there that he does not marry. He doesn't necessarily marry the best woman with the best resume. He marries who he loves. Can, can you see the problem with the whole way we've approached the gospel? We've got a problem here. But it's right here. And remember in the last class we talked about husbands, love your wives, and wives do what? Submit. Submit. And what did we say that was about? Christ in the church. So, what does it say? Submit yourself. To who? God. Because we are His bride. We're choosing to submit. That's what that scripture is about. Submit to Him. Then, it says, submit yourself to God, then resist the devil, and he'll flee. See, the devil is there to tempt you. He has a purpose. I mean, think about it. I know it sounds a little strange. You decide, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try again in a relationship. And all of a sudden, your ex shows up in the garden with, you, with you, the one that you're betrothed. That sounds a little strange to me. After all, why would Lucifer be allowed down here? Gee, I wonder. Is it starting to make sense to you? First Samuel 16, for God sees not as man sees, for God looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of man, but God knows your heart. Can you see the issue here? Is it, is it clear? The Bible's not wrong. We're the ones who are wrong. It's there, very, very clear. It's just somehow is a lot more expedient for us to, to deal with obedience and disobedience because then we got a ways to deal with this. The church can deal with this. Oh, you've, you've committed a sin. You get your problem. The problem's not the sin, folks. The problem's your heart. And I got news for you. Even if your obedience was perfect, what can the law not do? Change your heart. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Now, the reason I stuck this in here is because some people actually think that when Jesus showed up, the reason he didn't congratulate the Pharisees is that Jesus is a nice guy. It's that, you know, God, you know, he's been really rough. You know, he's the one who killed all his people in the wilderness, but this nice Jesus is somebody else. But you know what? Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. It's not, you know, you know, bad God, good Jesus. You see that. But the world would try to make you think, well, wait a minute. In the Old Testament, this happened. In the New Testament. But no, it's our interpretation. It's the problem. It's not God. So... In the original sin, can you understand now this, the key scripture? In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God. Can you see that's what's happening here? That's the original sin. So what concerns would the Lord have about taking a bride who will be married to for eternity? Is it getting clearer now? It's not obedience isn't your main concern. Will she be faithful? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What was the original sin? Pride, self-righteousness, arrogance, all those things that destroy your relationships. Who was the original sinner? Lucifer. And where did it take place? We got that one right. The Garden of Eden. Well, sort of. That's right. So why would God put Lucifer on earth with man? Is it getting clearer what the purpose is? Why bad things might happen to good people? There's an end game here. Oh, I threw this in. I couldn't help myself with this one. 
This is a, a song, obviously, by Lennon and McCarthy. And uh, I just got to say what John Lennon said. It was purely unconscious that it came out to be LSD until someone pointed it out. I never even thought that's what it would mean. Whoever would bother to look at the initials of the title? The song, of course, had nothing to do with drugs and LSD, right? Then they didn't even know the initials spelled LSD. But did they know who they were talking about? Who is it? Lucifer. Lucifer in the sky with diamonds. So if they didn't put the LSD in there, did they do that? And if they didn't, that's even more scary. <laughs> Lucy in the sky with diamonds is Lucifer. And yet, it, it's totally amazing to me. If they didn't understand this, that's scary. How will the Lord decide who he will marry? That's the next class. The next class is called the two trees. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 9b. And the question, why would God put two trees on the earth? Any guesses already? Choice? An interesting concept. Does that make sense with what we're discussing? Sure does. What do the true trees represent in the Bible? And what do the two trees represent in your life? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for an understanding of what's important to you, Lord. Lord, we, we want you to know our name. We want you to know who we are. Lord, we don't want to ever hear, depart from me, I never knew you. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you're giving us revelation about what's important to you and that you're, give, you're bringing relationships around us. And you're using those relationships, Lord, to teach us, Lord, how, how it is that we can understand you. We look forward to the union which you've designed in the marriage, the true marriage, the marriage between you and your bride. And, Lord, we want to be that bride. And I ask you to give revelation to each one here, Lord, of the things that they're going through and the preparation that is, Father. Let them be encouraged, Lord. Let them see the truth of what's important to you, that we may know you, that we may love you. And we thank you in Jesus' name.